reading food labels and always deciding, you know, maybe I'm, I have a little cold today. I think I'm going to buy things that have extra vitamin C. But I really wanted to start the lecture off by Come on. What happened? Oh, come on. Just through. How about this one? The more you eat, the less flavor. The less you eat, the more flavor. I kind of believe that because the first bite is always the best, right? Or that first sip of coffee in the morning, oh, that's like the best. By the time you get to the second cup, ah, eh, it's not all that exciting. How about this one? No disease that can be treated by diet should be treated with any other means. Ah, oh, I gotta, I gotta remind some of my pharmacists about this statement. How about this one? It is easier to change a man's religion than to change his diet. Well, being in practice, I got to tell you, it really is very difficult to change somebody's diet, but I try. Now, we all know about Hippocrates. He was actually the first that really highlighted using food as medicine. So he actually said that our food should be our medicine. Our medicine should be our food. Um, he was telling people to eat nutrient dense foods even before we understood what that meant. Using food as medicine, there are references in the Bible. It's been um, spanned over many different cultures, Chinese culture, Indian culture, Greek medicine. So it's not a new concept. How about this? Did you know that Nostradamus, remember that guy that made all those predictions and prophecies? He actually published a cookbook. Now I couldn't get my hands on the cookbook. First of all, it's in French and it's from like the 16th century. So. But he actually had a recipe on there for preserved pumpkin, and he touted that as having fever-reducing abilities. We know now that pumpkin is very high in beta-carotene, which makes vitamin A, and vitamin A is really good for your immune system. So even though he might not have had the science behind it, um, it was actually true what he was saying. So I don't know, did he prophesy that? So when you look at different foods, we call foods that actually go above and beyond just nutrition, we call them functional foods, even though there's no legal or governmental definition of it. But a functional food is something that contains ingredients or nutrients in it that actually confer health. So they might contain omega-3s or vitamin C or vitamin A or extra fiber. Those would be actually considered functional foods. I think that where we're going to go in the future is something called nutrigenomics. Um, nutrigenomics is actually defined as the science of how molecules in our body, in the food, actually interact with our own genes. So it's a very personalized approach to nutrition. Um, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And it's really interesting how, you know, somebody can drink coffee and not have a problem with it. And yet other people might drink coffee and the caffeine might cause heart, you know, fibrillation. You know, that's genetically predisposed. Or you might have heard stories about, you know, somebody that ate healthy all their lives and then got cancer. Okay, well, that doesn't usually happen. Um, it's a smaller percentage of the population. But again, that's genetically controlled. So it'll be really interesting to see what the scientists can come out with in terms of these test kits. I think one day we're going to be testing your blood and looking at different uh, genomic markers. And this way, I, I can really personalize nutrition based on you. You know, an apple for you might be unhealthy, <laughs> believe it or not. And an apple for somebody else might be really healthy. So I think going, we're just not quite there yet. Now, foods can prevent or treat chronic diseases like cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. So let's talk about that for a second. So foods that can prevent heart disease. Well, we know foods that are low in saturated fat can help to prevent heart disease. We know that foods that are high in carotenoids and vitamin A and vitamin C and vitamin E, those are all good to prevent heart disease. Uh, diabetes, we know that too much sugar and too many calories can lead to weight gain, which can actually lead to diabetes. Um, certain foods can uh, cure conditions like a urinary tract infections. I don't know if you've heard about drinking cranberry juice. That is actually pretty preventative. The actual cranberry juice in and of itself is very acidic. So what it does is it keeps your urethra and ureter very acidic so the E. coli can't stick to it. That's why that can prevent urinary tract infections. High cholesterol, believe it or not, fiber can help treat high cholesterol, or even almonds. 12 almonds a day has been researched to be as strong as um, statin drugs. 
Again, not in everybody. Um, hypoglycemia, that would be um, when you eat or when you have lack of food, your blood sugar drops too low. So actually using food as medicine to make sure your blood sugars don't drop is actually a way that food um, connects with conditions. And then constipation, that's a common occurrence, right? So we need to increase our soluble and insoluble fiber. There are different foods that can improve mental states like depression, anxiety, stress. I think some of you might have come to my mind diet uh, presentation. So we do know a modified Mediterranean diet actually keeps our brain now, when I show you this slide, I know it's kind of a busy slide, but what it's showing you is that there are many nutritional deficiencies that can occur if you don't get a variety of foods, because a variety of foods is going to contain many different vitamins and minerals that we're going to need for all different bodily processes. So even if you take, looking at this, bleeding gums, you might have a vitamin C deficiency or maybe even a folic acid deficiency or hair loss. Maybe it's a biotin deficiency, which is quite rare actually in the United States. Maybe it's a zinc deficiency. Or maybe if you, if you look at your nails and your nails break really easily, or if they're kind of misshapen, that could actually be an iron deficiency or maybe even a B12 deficiency. So when I actually talk to my patients, I do something called a nutrition focused physical exam. And some of my patients allow me to touch them as well because I'm looking at different parts of their body to see if I can identify a nutritional deficiency. By the time it manifests on the outside, that's pretty that point, um, you know, some vitamin deficiencies can happen very quickly and some of them happen over time. Like vitamin B1, which is thiamine. Thiamine deficiency is extremely dangerous. It's pretty rare in the general population, but if you have malnutrition or if you have uh, if you suffer from alcoholism or if you have on your stomach or your intestines, you might develop a B1 deficiency and develop something called And beriberi is very dangerous. It could definitely reduce the quality, lead to death. Beriberi has cardiovascular, um, hurts the heart, and it can also hurt the nerve tissue as well. It even leads to a psychosis called Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome, which So when you think, boy, oh boy, it's best to have a variety of food. Now, would you take a multivitamin? That would be something that you could discuss with your doctor mm -hmm. and your pharmacist because a multivitamin might be indicated, especially if you can't eat that much. To different foods. So that might be um, a suggestion. Work like mesin. Well, the way it does is it decreases inflammation. And we know that the inflammatory process is actually, it hurts us and helps us. Now, is that when you get a cut or an injury, your body inflammatory process to instigate the immune system. So in that case, it's helpful, right? It's trying to help you. But prolonged inflammation actually causes conditions. So if you have cardiovascular disease or you have overweight or obesity or you have autoimmune diseases, that causes inflammation, which systemically can... conditions. So food can actually quell some of this. And then as we control that inflammation, we heal and decrease um, incidences of disease. How else does food work like medicine? It can balance our hormones. Um, you know, when we look at, there's so many different hormones, right? You've got the thyroid hormone, you've got the sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. You've got vitamin D. Vitamin D is even a hormone. Um, certain foods can actually balance these hormones because hormones react in what's called this feedback system. So when you secrete a hormone and it does its job, then it's supposed to cut itself off. So it's this feedback. So what happens is sometimes if we don't produce enough of the hormone, the body's trying to instigate it. You know, hey, secrete the hormone, secrete the hormone. And if you're not producing the hormone, you're in this wicked cascade that just doesn't turn off. A good example of that would be the thyroid. Um, many of us have thyroid disorders. Now thyroid um, gland is very important because it does regulate metabolism, but it's also very important for your heart health. So the thyroid, if you don't make enough hormone, 
lot of times use medications like Synthroid or or level thyroxine, but I'm going to show you perhaps a food that will help balance some of our hormones. The other way food works like medicine is it actually does the body. So what does that mean? When you look at the pH scale, we've got a scale from one to 10. The pH from one to five, 5.5, six is very acidic. And the body doesn't like acidity. That actually can lead to different um, free radicals and things that destroy cells. So we want our body to be nice and neutral, like in the sevens, 7.5, 7.3. So when you eat certain foods, I'll give you an example. If you eat protein, like most of us do, right? Proteins are good for us. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But just say you have a nice, beautiful, juicy steak, right? You get a filet mignon and a baked potato and you're having a field day. Well, unfortunately, although the protein's good for us, what happens is that protein makes our body kind of acidic. So our kidneys and our liver and our lungs actually have to work to get it into a more neutral balance. So there are other foods that actually can help do that. So when you look at all these beautiful vegetables and fruits, that actually helps to alkalize the body. So if you are gonna eat acidic food like proteins, definitely have it with your fruits and vegetables because that helps to neutralize and balance the body. How else does food work like medicine? Well, it balances blood sugar. We constantly have to have glucose in our blood because that's what gives us instant energy. Not just energy to move from point A to point B, but also to, to contract our muscles, to make sure our heart is beating, to make sure our brain is functioning. So you have to have a certain amount, a certain range of blood sugar. Now, if you get a blood test and you get the blood glucose read, it usually shows anywhere between, let's see, 120 is about normal, right? Even though doctors don't really want it to go up to 120, so 110 or so. So if every time we eat food, whatever food it is, our body's going to digest it and then convert it into glucose. And if we have excessive glucose, that excessive glucose gets stored as fat. So the way food works as medicine is it can actually balance our blood sugar. So if you eat foods with high fiber, or if you eat foods with good saturated fat, that actually helps to slow down the digestive process so you don't have these surges of blood sugar. So that's why even my patients that have diabetes, I always put them on a high fiber diet because that actually helps to slow down that digestion so they don't have these blood sugar surges. And then it also helps to bring down that blood sugar naturally. The other way that food works like medicine is actually helps to improve nutrient absorption. I'll give you a good example of this. So just say you take your calcium because your doctor said, look, you need to take some calcium. You're not eating enough. Your bones are getting brittle. Okay, take your calcium, but you also have to take vitamin D with it because vitamin D helps calcium to absorb. Another example would be iron. So iron is very good for our blood. Iron is very good for metabolism. But if you don't have enough vitamin C in your system, you really can't absorb iron all that great either. So that's how nutrients actually work synergistic to each other. Now, the majority of medicinal foods that we're going to talk about are plant-based. So it doesn't mean that you have to be a vegetarian. If you choose to be a vegetarian, I think that it could be a very healthy diet if you do know what you're talking about. And veganism is becoming very hot on the market. But again, if you're a vegan and you don't know what you're doing in terms of protein complementary pairing, then you can actually make yourself sick. So um, I think a variety of foods is appropriate, but certainly if you do choose to have just plant-based or veganism, that could be healthy too. But let's talk about the nutrients first. So the first macro I think we have to describe, well, a protein food would be anything that comes from an animal, right? So if you're eating chicken or eggs or dairy or steak or seafood or shellfish, you're getting good quality protein because they have all the essential amino acids. 
essential amino acids are those amino acids that we need to build up other protein structures. So we have a total of 20 amino acids, nine of which are essential that you have to get from your diet. As long as we're getting those nine, we can make the other 11. So what exactly does a protein do in our body? Well, a protein is every single structure of your body, every single one of them, from your hair to your cheek cells to your tongue, your heart, your liver, everything is a protein, but it's also functional. So all your hormones, your blood, your neurotransmitters, your, all of that is a protein. So if we don't eat enough of it, we are gonna become deficient. This is just a list of the different essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. I only put this up here because some of us might be taking some supplements and supplements, especially those shakes, make sure they have all the essential amino acids. Um, some of them that are plant-based might have to add some. Now this is what could happen if you don't have enough protein. If you don't have enough protein intake, you could actually waste your muscles. So the picture here on the left-hand side is a condition called sarcopenia. That's where somebody has lost so much muscle mass that not only can you see it, you're gonna feel very, very weak, okay? So definitely protein is important, but how much should we eat? So here's an example of how much we should actually eat. So if we like to do math, since we're at home, we might have a calculator next to you. If you wanna figure out how much protein you actually need to eat per day, you take your weight and you've got to convert it into kilograms. And the way you would do that is you take your weight and I have an example here. Just say you're 150 pounds, divide by kilograms, okay? As soon as you get kilograms, 0 0.8 grams is what's recommended um, per body weight of how much protein you need to eat per day. So for somebody 150 pounds, <clears throat> you multiply it by 0 0.8, they would need about 55 grams of protein per day just to maintain their health, maintain their muscles, their hormones, et cetera. Female eat grams of protein a day. So we're definitely eating enough protein. Actually, some of us are eating too much protein. So let's give you an example of how we can convert that to food. Well, three ounces of tuna about, or salmon, cod, trout, approximately 21 grams. Three ounces is only about the size of a deck of cards. Three ounces of turkey or chicken, about 19 grams. Six ounces of plain Greek yogurt, it depends on the brand, anywhere between 12 to 15 grams. cottage half a cup can give you about 12 grams of protein uh, one cup of milk about eight grams even pasta eight grams some nuts seven grams so when we look at a chart like this it really isn't difficult to get the minimum amount of protein per day unless of course you have an illness or something that might prevent you from doing so what else does protein do well look at this protein builds the immune system. I know next month I'm gonna talk about how to make your immune system strong, but I can tell you right now, if you're not eating enough protein, you're not keeping your immune system strong. Our immune system is composed of white blood cells, antibodies, B cells, T cells, T killer cells, so many different cells. And all the cells require protein in order to grow and replicate and do its function. So that's why you need to have enough protein. I think one good technique to get enough protein if you have a hard time eating food would of course be protein supplements, some of those protein shakes that are out there. Um, there are so many different brands out on the market now. Most of them are made out of a whey protein, which is a protein from milk. But if you don't like that, you can always go to an egg protein. Egg is a very, very good bioavailable protein for the human body. If you decide you wanna be more vegetarian, I recommend a pea protein. Pea protein is also a very good absorbable protein by the human body. Protein also keeps our other blood cells very healthy. Anemia is just a term that means you're not making enough red blood cells. Well, what could be the problem in that? Well, think about the job of a red blood cell. A red blood cell carries nutrition to all of your body organs and tissues. Um, red blood cells also carry oxygen. 
um, to, to make sure you're, you're oxygenating your tissues. And it also takes away toxins and it takes away carbon dioxide. It takes away all the bad things. So if we're, we have anemia, then our, our blood cell is just not working the way it's supposed to. So anemia can be caused by not having enough protein. It can be caused by not having enough iron or enough B12, or enough vitamin E, or enough B6. So there are lots of different things that actually can cause anemia. So again, because there are so many things that can cause the disease, having a nice variety in your diet will help prevent it. I put this picture on there. Sorry, it's, I know it's not a very pleasant picture, so let's do this one instead. You know, one thing that we do see when you don't get enough protein, it really manifests gum tissue. Um, I work with a surgical population and sometimes I have dentists call me up saying, oh my gosh, what happened to my patient? No, what happened to my patient? Well, what was happening is if you have a surgical process where you're not getting enough protein, it really does manifest in the gum disease. Um, so you definitely don't want to get to this periodontitis that not only looks very painful, but certainly you'll run the risk of losing your teeth and then that'll lead to other problems. All right, so the next macro I wanna talk about are fats. Now fats get a bad rap just because we know too much fat can actually lead to heart disease. And unfortunately, when you look at the American diet, we just have excess in many things. So we're eating too much fat. But how is um, uh, fat used as medicine? Well, we have to have some fat, absolutely, because you, you need fat to absorb fat soluble vitamins. We have four fat soluble vitamins that are very important to our body. Vitamin A, vitamin D, E, and vitamin K. So if you don't get enough fat, you'll have a hard time absorbing those fat soluble vitamins and then it's going to lead to a vitamin deficiency and then lead to a whole bunch of other different problems. Um, fat is also necessary for our energy reserves. Um, just say, you know, you, you get the flu or God forbid you get something worse and you can't really eat a lot. Well, we're going to be sustaining our life through our energy reserves, which is fat tissue. Fat also helps to regulate our body temperature. Um, fat is also com composed in, in every single cell, um, your brain, your spinal cord, your nerves, all of your cells actually have a component of fat in them. Um, fat, believe it or not, confers heart health, not saturated fat omega-3s. So we'll talk about that in a second. And also, it also cushions your organs as well. Now, too much fat, like I said, is very harmful. And why? Well, too much fat can lead to obesity and overweight. And then that in and of itself can lead to that inflammation. So inflammation will lead to heart disease, atherosclerosis, and something called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a triad of a disease. And it's if you have a combination of high cholesterol, high blood pressure, obesity, you know, that's kind of a ticking time bomb. You're either going to get diabetes, stroke, heart disease. So well, metabolic syndrome is pretty dangerous. And of course, diabetes. So how much fat should we eat? Well, according to all these, you know, smart dental agencies that govern how much we're supposed to eat, well, 20 to 35% of our calories can come from fat, but five to 10% should be saturated fat because it's the saturated fat that we know harms our health. So trans fat, there's nothing good about it. So I recommend 0%, which is very difficult to do if you eat processed foods. A trans fat is a totally man-made fat that our body has no clue what to do with it. So when we eat it, it just causes harm. So that's why we want trans fats to be as close to zero as possible. And cholesterol, less than 300 milligrams per day. why eggs, everybody picks on eggs. Eggs are really healthy for us, but if you have high egg, contains about 300 milligrams of cholesterol. So that's why if you have high cholesterol that you're trying to, you know, take care of, eating whole eggs every single day is just contributing to how much cholesterol you're actually intaking. And then that can, of course, elevate cholesterol levels. All right, so how do we figure out how much fat we're supposed to eat? So I'm just giving you an example. Just say you eat 1,200 calories per day, 
and your healthy fat, well, how much did we say? We want to keep healthy fat, 20 to 35% of our calories and saturated fat, about 5 to 10% of our calories. So you can have about 27 to 47 grams of fat per day, but you want to keep your saturated fat to about 13 grams per day. So I know that sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. So let's give you an example. This is why nutritionists are always saying, look, if you eat animal products, you've got to keep it lean because fat is, goes along with animal products. So the more fat you eat, the higher your percentage is, the higher the risk. So if you're eating turkey, that's one of the leanest meats out there. Chicken breast, pork loin, uh, lamb shake is, is a little bit fattier, beef tenderloin, veal loin. So this just gives you an example. So turkey breast, as you can see, is pretty lean. Same thing with seafood. Seafood is pretty lean as well, although it's higher in fat because of the omega-3s. So fat deficiencies can lead to these vitamin deficiencies. I kind of mentioned that already. So just say you get a vitamin A deficiency. I know this looks terrible, I'm so sorry, but not only can it lead to poor immunity, it can actually lead to infections and it can also lead to wounds that won't heal. And it can also lead to skin issues too. This is something called hyperkeratosis. It's a condition of the skin where you have a vitamin deficiency. And how about a vitamin D deficiency, which many of us have, by the way. And vitamin D deficiency is pretty dangerous because not only will it affect your bones, it can actually affect your heart, it can affect your kidneys, it can affect your brain. And then fatty acid deficiency. So let's talk about the fatty acids. So when you look at fats, you've got those good fats and those bad fats. I, I don't really like to use that terminology, but saturated fats you want to limit, trans fats you definitely want to avoid. Um, but the good fats are really the omega-3s. The omega-6s, unfortunately, the American population is eating too much omega-6, and then it becomes not healthy for us. So I'd rather we have the omega-3s. So where are the omega-3s found? Omega-3s are actually found, I'm going to come back to that, in our fattier fish. So what would happen if you had a deficiency? Well, we know that omega-3 deficiency leads to all of these conditions, arthritis, fibromyalgia, anxiety, asthma, cancer, etc. So that's why it's really arthritis. important to get. Oh, yeah. Yep. Arthritis. Arthritis, yeah. yep. Cardiovascular disease, skin oh, disorders. Arthritis is terrible. Minus. Okay, so let's you see where you seafood. would get those omega-3s. <laughs> okay, so how much seafood should you eat? Well, the American Heart Association recommends consumption of two servings of fish per week for those that have no history of heart disease. Daily? Per week. We so those with coronary disease, they're saying at least one serving of fish daily. Okay, now I know that there's some controversy you about the mercury and fish and you know the thing is when, when you look at different foods there are things in foods that are also unhealthy for us as well so omega-3s if you're going to eat seafood you might as well get bang for your buck look at this herring herring has greater than 1500 milligrams it is on top of the list salmon mackerel i think they mean creamed three ounces yeah <laughs> Well, that's funny. So let's talk about, I hear somebody saying about creamed herring. Well, you know, creamed herring is, is really tasty, but remember the cream that they're using is pretty high in fat. Um, but you know what, if you're using it once in a while, it's okay, because we can still have some fat in our diet, right? And then these are just some other products. Sorry, that cut, cut off a little bit, but tuna, pollock, clams, lobster. So these have about 200 to 500 milligrams per three ounces which again is not very big. Now, those of us that want to go more plant-based, you know, um, found in nuts, seeds, whole grains, soy, beans, what about legumes, seaweed, seaweed's really good for us. If you've never tried it, it's a vegetable, you might as well go for it, try it. Green leafy vegetables. Now, the thing with the omega-3s really in these plants, they're in the form of omega-6s in, and they have to be converted to omega-3s, but the body can do that. Cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, squash, berries, mangoes. So all of these also contain omega-3s. And that probably comes as a surprise to a lot of people because when we think about omega-3s, we're always thinking about fish, but it's not just fish, it's also the plants. Herbs and spices, I can't say enough about herbs. 
spices. They're so under um, looked, but herbs and spices, think about what they are. They're plants and they have essential oils and they're so healthy for us. So definitely spice up your, your food with different herbs and spices. And flaxseed, I love flaxseed because it tops the list for the vegetarian source of omega-3s. Look at this, one ounce packs in over 6,000 milligrams of omega-3s. You just have to make sure you grind it because that's really how the body can utilize the omega-3s. If you don't grind them, that's okay too. You can eat them. It's going to be a high source of fiber, but you really won't get the omega-3 benefit from it. And I also recommend... Um, grinding it yourself. Because when you buy it ground, you never know um, just where it's been stored in the store. And um, omega-3s are very sensitive to oxidation, you know, any kind of air and any kind of sunlight or light. And it actually decreases its bioavailability. So it would be best if you just bought the flaxseed and put it in a coffee grinder and ground it yourself. All right, so let's go to the next macro, the carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates are not the enemy, but unfortunately, or fortunately, the carbohydrates constitute the, most of the foods that we eat. So what's a carb? Well, dairy is a carb, right? Because it has the lactose in it. Vegetables, fruits, starches. And remember, Starches constitute what? Rice, pasta, cereal, etc. So it's the bulk of the food that we eat. And unfortunately, we're eating too much of it. But if you don't get enough carbohydrate, that could actually be bad, not just for your muscles, but also your brain and your nerve health. We actually need a minimum of 30 to 50 grams of carbohydrate per day for proper brain function. For those of us that, are tried, that have tried certain diets like a keto diet or certain very, very low carbohydrate diets, you might actually experience this symptom almost like you got the flu, like you got this fishbowl over your head. And that's because your brain is struggling to function on the ketones. So you need 30 to 50 grams of carb every day for proper brain health. So what does that look like? Well, you got to look at the serving sizes. Each of these serving sizes that I'm showing you gives approximately, except for the veggies, gives approximately 15 grams of carb. So half a cup of cooked rice or cooked pasta gives you about 15 grams, one ounce of bread, fruit, about half a cup of cut fruit. Um, if it's tropical fruit though, probably go a little bit less because tropical fruits tend to be, um, have more sugar in them. Three quarter cups of berries, so you can actually go up with the berries. One whole small piece of fruit. When we say small piece, we're talking about of a baseball or a tennis ball, so it's pretty small. Six ounces of fruit juice. Um, these, I'm just giving you the serving sizes per day on average, four to five servings per day, three servings of fruit per day. Milk and dairy, one, about 12 to 15 grams of carb, six ounces of yogurt, one ounce of cheese. You can have about one to two servings per day. It all depends on how many calories you're following. Now, vegetables only have about five carbs five grams of carbs per serving. So one cup of raw spinach only has five carbs. So that's why we're always saying eat lots of vegetables because it's very low in calorie and it's very high in fiber. It's really good for us. And for vegetables, when it's cooked, about half a cup is a serving size. So it says four to five servings per day, but hey, go crazy with your vegetables. They're really healthy for us. They're so healthy for us that there's this whole science called phytotherapy. And it really looks at what are the components in these plants that act for health. This is what's found in plants. So this is such an amazing chart. It gets me so excited to look at it. So phytochemicals are found in plants. And the phytochemicals could, are categorized as carotenoids. And you might have heard of those before, right? Beta carotene and lutein and lycopene. But there's also the polyphenols, like the flavonoids and the lignins and the stilbens and the phenolic acids. Um, and you've heard of flavones and isoflavones. Flavones. So this chart just shows you really all the chemicals that we know of as of right now that are in plants that can confer health in, in some way, shape, or form. 
So what do these polyphenols do? Well, the research shows it can help prevent or treat diabetes. Definitely helps the aging process in the sense that it helps to protect cells. Because if cells of your body die prematurely, they generate. And every time they re Before they really want to regenerate, there's always a chance of it becoming mutated, so it leads to cancer. Cardiovascular disease, infections, asthma, hypertension. So this is just some of what we know that the polyphenols do to protect our health. So how do we eat these polyphenols? Well, I'm just going to give you an easy trick. Just eat every single color of the rainbow, because if you eat a variety of these different colors, you're going to get these polyphenols. So let's look at red. If you're eating tomatoes and fruit and watermelon and cherries, yum. They not only do they, it just sounds yummy, but it, it contains lycopene that can help to um, reduce free radicals, which helps to reduce. Then the yellow and green, like spinach and collard greens and all the green leaf green, that contains lutein and zeaxanthine. That is really good to help to reduce the risk of macular degeneration, which actually is the number one cause of blindness in the elderly. Cataracts. It's actually a yellow green substance, um, which actually helps it back the eye, and that's what actually helps to keep that macula very healthy. Um, these colors also help to reduce atherosclerosis, which of course would reduce heart disease. And how about orange? So you got the carrots and the mangoes, cantaloupes, beta carotene. And what's really cool about beta carotene is that actually converts to vitamin A. So our body can actually convert it to a vitamin. Um, it's good for our eyes. It's good for night, night to prevent night blindness. Um, vitamin A is an antioxidant. Vitamin A helps immunity. Vitamin A helps the mucous membranes. So vitamin A is amazing. How about the yellow group? Pineapples, tangerines, oh, that's orange. <laughs> orange and yellow group. Papayas, nectarines. So these contain something called beta cryptothanthin. And this helps um, cells to communicate. They, you know, our cells have to talk to each other, especially cells of the immune system. They actually have to talk to each other. Um, it prevents heart disease. Um, it contains vitamin C. And vitamin C is also an antioxidant. Vitamin C helps to keep our blood healthy. So just really, really great for us. Don't forget about the red purple, like the beets and the eggplant, and the purple grapes, blueberries, yum. So these contain a component called anthocyanins, and the anthocyanins help to protect, uh, protect us against heart disease. Also, it contains resveratrol. Resveratrol, we know, also helps the heart by increasing HDL and helping to lower cholesterol as well. So you don't really have to have the glass of wine if you don't drink wine or you don't drink alcohol. Just go for some of those purple grapes or maybe have about a six-ounce glass of um, grape juice because that'll do the same thing. And let's not forget about white. I know white always gets a bad rap too, like the white bread and the white rice, but white can actually be pretty healthy for us when we're talking about the white leeks and the scallions and the garlic and the onions and the endive. The onion family actually contains um, at something called allicin. And allicin we know has anti-tumor properties. Um, so definitely eat your garlic, it's really good for you. And just a trick on garlic, if you don't like that astringent garlicky taste, you can bake garlic as though it was a baked potato. You just kind of cut the, the top a little bit, you put it in foil and you put it in the oven and bake it. And it comes out so creamy and smoky and it's really great. You can actually use it on your bread and your toast instead of butter. Um, it also has um, flavonoids called quercetin and camphorol, and all these things are just really good for our health on the biochemistry level. And how about green, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage? These um, have a, a component in them called sulforaphane, and you probably know that because every time you make broccoli or cabbage, whoo, your house probably smells like sulfur a little bit. But that's actually the component that's really good for our health. Also, the isocyanate. So we know that these things also help to protect against cancer. 
brown and tan. Well, let's think about that. Mushrooms, dates, ginger, Jerusalem artichokes. Oh my gosh, they are so good for us. They're actually really good for the immune system as well because they contain properties that are antibacterial as well. They help to strengthen our immune system, especially the natural killer cells. The natural killer cells are these lymphocytes. They're white blood cells that actually kill viruses. So we want to make sure our killer cells are really strong. So go out there and eat your mushrooms, your portobello mushrooms, your shiitake mushrooms, your porcini mushrooms. They're very good for us. Ginger is also amazing for us. It contains something called gingerol and shogun. Well, and these are the chemicals that actually help to reduce that inflammatory process. Um, it's also been linked to help um, with stomach issues, respiratory issues, motion sickness, sickness, even arthritis as well. You can eat ginger raw if you don't mind that really strong taste, or you can use it in cook. out of it. It's just really good for us. And what's interesting about this ginger is this is actually amazing. And this right here is a little eye. You can actually plant this and it'll start to grow. So it's just really such a great uh, vegetable. And green tea. Green tea is so good for us too because it does contain these that help to reduce the inflammation. It's also been shown to help with um, arthritis symptoms as well. And if you're afraid of the um, the caffeine in green tea, what's interesting is that green tea contains another chemical in it that helps to block the caffeine. So you can still drink this. Um, it also contains EGCG, which is a powerful antioxidant, which has been shown to help reduce um, damage from rheumatoid arthritis. Now cinnamon, I can't say enough about cinnamon too. It's a spice and it contains um, cinnamaldehyde and cinnamic acid and these are antioxidants. There's also research to show that cinnamon helps to um, blood sugar as well. So hey, put some cinnamon in your food. It doesn't just have to be in your oatmeal. Put it on your fish. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, I mean, I have a friend from Morocco and she puts cinnamon in everything and it just makes the food taste so good. Garlic, I think we mentioned this one before, but it has quercetin and organosulfur. It's good for our heart. It's an antimicrobial. It helps to detoxify the body. So keep going with your garlic. So I think really the take home message about food is, you know, think about food, you know, try to get bang for your buck, all right? We do know that plants, plants are good for us. We know. Showed you why. Stay within what we're supposed to eat. Try not to overeat on anything because too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Just try to eat a variety of food, um, track your intake, and, you know, change your diet. changes. To be living in Florida where we have access to all these great fruits and vegetables, so go for it. Um, get your annual wellness checkups. That's very important. I know some of the doctors are opening up their offices now, but even if you can do telemedicine, um, just stay up to date with your wellness checkups because that's really important as well. All right, I always like to end my presentations by showing you my sons, my furry sons. <laughs> so here they are. And that's it. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned. I hope you um, enjoyed the presentation. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay. Um, I am. I'm following a little bit of the Acid Watchers diet. Okay. Uh huh. And Onions and garlic. Yeah. It is our verboten. And I love garlic. Yes. You know what's interesting about different diets? It depends on what you're following the diet for. Um, you know, certain foods have positive things in them, but maybe for what you're looking for. So just keep them off your diet until you're not following that acid diet anymore. And then if you feel like you want to put it back in, put it back in. 
Is it easier to, I mean, should I, can they be cooked? Will that lessen the acidity? Um, it actually does. It actually does. But, you know, it's not part of the protocol on that diet. So I would have to see what the diet was and then modify it. Okay, do you remember the book, The Acid Watchers Diet? It's called The That's Acid really Watchers. Modern. Yeah, did they, do they say that you can have it cooked? No, they didn't say anything. Mm. Okay, so that diet wants to keep it out for now. But I got to tell you, uh, you know, yeah, leaving it out forever good. probably isn't the best thing because it does have very healthy properties to it. So okay. I'm going to add it back in. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> I have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, vitamin D uh, yes. is somewhat controversial, the amount we need. Yes. Um, it can go from, what, like 30 to 100, something like that. Yeah, it can go to 50,000 international uh, units. You, yeah. You but I just had a blood test. I don't test. know why I keep saying recording. I don't know what it's recording. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, what, what's your feelings about that? Okay, so when I'd rather you eat food that has vitamin D, because rarely will you overdose on vitamin D from food. Uh, if you do need a supplement, the dosage would be based on what your levels are. So a good example of that would be vitamin D has a range between 30 to yeah. about 110, I believe. So if you're at 30, you're still within normal for your vitamin D, but it's optimal. So maybe the doctor might recommend 500 international units or 1,000 international units, something that's not very high. But just say you had... 15, you had half of what it should be, then the doctor might want to put you on a prescription dosage of 5,000 international units. So I think it's going to be based on what your personal labs are in order to make a recommendation of what your level should be in terms of the dosage. When yeah, I guess we absorb yeah. less as we age, right? I think we absorb less as we age. We right? do, unfortunately, and we make less of it as well. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Question. Okay. All right. So that was a lot of fun. I'm sorry I can't see you. I wish I could. I wish I could hug everybody, but certainly I can't. Um, I want you to stay safe. And um, if you have any questions, please direct them to Jamie and Karen, and they can get those questions to me. And I guess we're going to be doing it in this platform for a little while. So next month, we're going to yeah. talk about that strengthen your immune system. So hopefully you'll enjoy that one too. Yeah, I called you. All right, you guys. So thank you yeah. so much. Maybe, Jamie, you have any questions for me? No, no. With everyone, thank you so much for joining. Um, I, um, and I, I uh, definitely was muting some of you as you go. So um, sorry if you were trying to say something, but we just had some back, uh, background noise. But yeah, thank you so much for, for doing this, Lillian. We really Oh, my it. pleasure. Very my pleasure. Thanks, you guys. And if you think of any questions later on, hey, I'm always around. All right? Thank you. Bye, thank you guys. You. Bye. 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 Be safe. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Hi, Melanie. Hi, dear. How are you doing? Good. I just sent you a chat. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll look for the great lecture. Oh. Now I got to figure out how to get out of it. I'll let, I can uh, end it in, uh, in the meeting right. for everyone. So yeah, everyone it's up in the corner. It says leave. <laughs> leave. Leave meeting. I don't know. Okay. Bottom right. <laughs>